Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight, I'm continuing in the study of the book of Ecclesiastes, and I'm going to begin with chapter 5, verse 1. Hopefully, I'll get through the entire chapter. Uh, if you did not see the previous studies on Ecclesiastes, uh, they are available. They're uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. A lot of political telephone calls I'm getting lately. Uh, other, uh, I hope you will go back and watch this uh, study from the beginning. But for now, let me pick, uh, pick up with chapter 5, verse 1. And I am a KJV firstist. So I will read it first in the KJV. And I will probably look at it in the Amplified. Sometimes that is helpful to me. So, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. And be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. I mentioned, uh, I think last time, that one of the things that's interesting about uh, Ecclesiastes is it was written by King Solomon just as the book of Proverbs was written by King Solomon. And uh, sometimes you see a, a verse or two in Ecclesiastes that reminds me very much of the book of Proverbs, the way it's written, particularly when it talks about wisdom or being a fool or being wise. And you get that kind of contrast. Uh, and this verse uh, makes me think of book of Proverbs. Um, so let me read this in the Amplify and see how it states it. Guard your steps and focus on what you are doing as you go to the house of God and draw near to listen rather than to offer careless or irrelevant sacrifice of fools. For they are too ignorant to know they are doing evil. So as you go, as you go to the house of God, um, I guess this is a reference to going to church or going to, uh, in Solomon's time, the, uh, the temple or the uh, synagogue. Um, but it says, guard your steps and focus on what you're doing uh, and draw near to listen rather than offer the careless or irrelevant sacrifice of fools. Uh, listen. In other words, this, it's another thing you learn in Proverbs is that there's a, a many times we're told to be a good listener. One of the biggest mistakes we all make, uh, and unless we learn better, is that we, we tend to want to talk rather than listening. And you don't learn by talking. You learn by listening. So it says, and draw near to listen rather than to offer the careless or irrelevant sacrifice of fools for they are too ignorant to know they're doing evil they are foolish people uh sometimes i guess they are just so ignorant about what they're doing they may not even know what they're doing is evil i think many times though fools they're perfectly aware that what they're doing is evil now back to the kjv for verse two it says be not rash with thy mouth and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. Uh, do not be rash with thy mouth. Well, I think that's wise, whether you're talking to God or talking to uh, man. Uh, we should not be rash. We should not be so quick to just blurt out uh, whatever we're thinking or there's supposed to be a filter between our brain and our mouth so that not, not every thought we have comes out verbally. We filter it. And that's what this is saying here. Be not rash when you speak. Let thine heart be hasty. And let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. So this is not only before God, uh, because God is omnipresent, everything we utter is before God. Uh, but 
Perhaps this is still referencing the first verse about going to the house of God, to church. When you're, when you're uh, there with the purpose of worshiping God or uh, praying to God, then it says, don't be hasty uh, to, to say things. Think before you speak. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. Yeah. Sometimes prayer doesn't even have to be spoken. Uh, prayer can just be the yearnings, the yearnings of our heart. Uh, God knows our thoughts. God knows our, our uh, what we yearn for. He knows what we're afraid of. And he knows it before we can even speak it. And he even knows it before we think it. Let me read this verse in the Amplified. It says, Do not be hasty with your mouth, speaking careless words or vows. Okay, so the speaking vows is uh, how they see this verse. And that, that does make sense. Don't just go before God and quickly start making vows. Be careful before you make a vow. Or impulsive thought to bring up a matter before God. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, they're, they're very, very, maybe careful when they're speaking to other people. Uh, it is wise to be careful when you're speaking to other people. You don't just blurt out everything you think. You could offend people. It could be, uh, uh, you know, create a lot of problems if you just speak your mind all the time. But have you ever thought about applying that rule to, to God, to communicating to God. Don't be so rash just to blurt out things and, and make a vow before God or just uh, even when you pray, be contemplative. Think about it. Don't don't be uh, rash. Uh, and the let me see, the end of the verse says, uh, uh, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. I don't know the connection between those points there. If God is in heaven, I'm on earth for that reason. I should let my words be few. I, 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 don't, I don't understand that at all. But let me go back to verse 3 in the KJV. And it says, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. So this is this is reminding me a lot of the book of Proverbs. Uh, it's a, a lot of uh, exhortations about uh, um, what fools do. Don't be a fool. Don't do this because it's foolish. And here we have in Ecclesiastes this uh, uh, discussing uh, fools again. So, so it says. Um, for a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. I mean, there's a verse in Proverbs that, that says that, uh, you know, be slow to speak because uh, um, if you speak, people, you could be exposing yourself to people that you're a fool. But if you remain silent, Sometimes people think you're wise just because you're a man of few words. You must be wise. That's what it says in Proverbs. So uh, it is it, it is instructive, a person that has to just talk, 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 talk all the time. Uh, it says that that's, that's what foolish people do. So I guess it's, it's better to be a person of few words and uh, be, be more careful when you speak. Let me read this in the Amplified, see how it expresses it. Verse um, 3, For the dream comes through much effort, and the voice of the fool through many words. Yeah. So this is instructive to us in terms of we identify fools by people who just want to babble away. And, of course, you if you do that, you, you will be identified as a fool. So be careful not to do that yourself. Let's look at verse 4, uh, back to the KJV. It says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, 
defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. So, you know, in verse 2, it's talking about don't be so quick to make vows. Be careful. And then verse 4 says, when you do make a vow to God, defer not to pay it. Now, don't break your vow. Uh, you've heard of the many people, there's a, many examples of people that uh, say, uh, oh, God, if you please just help me get with this situation. You know, you, there's someone's going to be die or they're starving or there's some serious thing that they need and they're crying out to God and say, if you just do this for me, I'll just dedicate my whole life to you. And as soon as they're rescued, all of a sudden they disregard their vow, their plea to God, their arrangement that they made with God. They, they forget it quickly. And this verse is here. It says, you better take that seriously. Let me read it in the Amplified. When you make a vow or a pledge to God, do not put off paying, paying it. For God takes no pleasure in fools who thoughtlessly mock him. Pay what you vow. Well, uh, we're also told in the scriptures not to even make vows. I believe it's uh, Jesus talking in, in Matthew or one of the gospel accounts uh, about uh, don't make a vow in the temple. Don't make it to the gold in the temple. Just make your yes, yes, and your, your no, no. Uh, don't take oaths or vows. Uh, let me read this now. Go back to the KJV. It says, verse 5, Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. I think that's true in life dealing with people. And now it tells us that's also very true with God. Don't make promises to God and then break them. It says God does not like, does not appreciate being mocked or don't try to make a fool out of God. Let me see how it phrases it. Verse five in the Amplified, it says, it is better that you should not vow than that, that you should vow and not pay. Now, verse 6 in the KJV says, Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Therefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands. Hmm. This, this verse here is like a puzzle to, uh, to try to unravel here. Let me read it in the Amplified. It says, do not allow your speech to cause you to sin. Do not allow your speech to cause you to sin. How could your speech cause you to sin? Well, G Jesus said that uh, um, out of the mouth comes the abundance of one's heart. So when you when you say something, it's you know that, that's what's coming out because that's what you, you is really in your heart, especially when you're impulsive. When you're impulsive, you're saying what you really think, how you really feel. Um, so it says again. Do not allow your speech to cause you to sin. Your speech could cause you to sin. Um, maybe the speech itself could be sin in terms of if you say something that's bad. Now, we talked the other day in one of these hangouts to talk, talk about um, uh, language, uh, various words that, are, that people consider to be uh, crude or vulgar or... Um, cuss words um, some, some people might call it cursing but I, I would say rather than curse words that uh, they would be cuss words vulgar words vulgar speech personally i don't talk like that normally and uh, i just i just never have 
I've heard, I've known a lot of people in my life that seem like every other word out of their mouth is the F word, you know, just this, this foul language constantly. And they, they make no attempt to, to uh, control their speech. But uh, the word, words are, are not uh, bad in themselves. It's, it's how you're applying these words. Uh, because every word just has a meaning. And whether you're saying, describing something in a proper word or using a vulgar word to express the same thing, uh, it's just a word. And now I think we should try to be proper because we want to, uh, we want to represent our, our, our faith in, in, in a way that's dignified rather than a way that's uh, not being bringing glory to God. So we should try to speak without using profanities and vulgarities, but really uh, there's nothing really sinful in terms of you choosing one word over another. But if, you, if you're speaking, whether it's uh, vulgar words or just words that let's say, um, it's a word that is hateful. It's not vulgar, but it's hateful. Well, uh, Jesus said that if we hate our brother, we've murdered them in our heart. So what we think and what we say uh, can be sin in that respect. And it's not It's not because certain words are sinful or evil. It's because of the, the, it expresses what's in our heart. Let me go back to the next verse in the KJV, and it says in verse 7, For in the multitude of dreams, uh, for in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also diverse vanities, but fear thou God. Diverse vanities. Okay, how does it say it in the Amplify? It says, for in a multitude of dreams and in a flood of words, there is worthlessness. Okay, vanity is something that's worthless. When he talked to her in the earlier chapters about everything is vanity, just that everything in life is worthless, pointless, meaningless. Only, only um, God gives us meaning in our lives. So this is talking now about uh, in a multitude of dreams and in a flood of words, there is worthlessness, flood of words. Uh, again, it's talking about uh, too many words, speaking so much, just like dribbling, dribbling away. There's words coming out of people's mouth without thought. Uh, in a way, I guess we should be, think of our the words as uh, um, um, a sacred thing. Sacred in terms of not only what we're talking about, what we're saying, but how much we say, if, if, if we just dribble on and on, just saying, you know, meaningless, uh, trivial things, then it, it, our words really have no value. They become, as it says here, worthless. In verse, uh, verse 8, it says, If thou seest the oppression of the poor and violent perverting of judgment and justice in a province, marvel not at the matter. For he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. Hmm. In the Amplified, it says, if you see the oppression of the poor and the denial of justice and righteousness in the province, so in your town, where you, wherever you're living, if you're seeing this going on, that the poor are being oppressed, that they're being treated unjustly, do not be shocked at the site of corruption, uh, why should we? There seems to be corruption uh, all, all around us and every society, every country has its corruption. For a higher official watches over another and there are higher ones over them looking out for one another. So even Solomon's time, now Solomon was the son of David 
David lived about a thousand years before Jesus. So this is roughly 900 BC. And even back then, it is, it's describing a society that's just corrupt and that uh, the uh, the people who are in power are just looking out for each other and covering each covering for each other. Verse 9 in the KJV says, Moreover, the profit of the earth is for all. The king himself have served by the field. In the Amplified, it says it this way. After all, a king who cultivates the field is an advantage to the land. So if you have a good king, he's cultivating the field. He's, he's, he's providing what is needed so that uh, the, uh, the land can be productive and the people in his kingdom can be productive. It's, it's an advantage. It's a blessing. And now the verse 10, he that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. It's just a materialism. Materialism is not going to give you satisfaction. Uh, the first chapter or two, that's what really Solomon was talking about there, is that he talked about uh, uh, the, his pursuit in uh, acquiring wisdom. His, his pursuit in acquiring wealth. And, you know, he was successful. He gained wisdom. He gained wealth. He gained uh, fame. But none of these things gave him satisfaction. They were all what he calls vanity, They're worthlessness, meaningless. And so he's saying here again that uh, silver is not, how is it phrased? Uh, he that loveth silver so if you love silver, or just that means could be used if you love money. Uh, he that loveth silver shall not be satisfied. You'll never be satisfied if you're if you're worshiping money. If money becomes your God, you'll just never have enough. Uh, nor that he that loveth abundance will with increase. Uh, so you have plenty and you get increased. It'll never give you be enough. It says, this also is vanity. And uh, in the Amplified, how does it phrase it? Uh, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with his gain. This too is vanity, emptiness. And let's go to verse 11 in the KJV. And it says, when goods increase... They are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the, the holding of them with their eyes? Hmm. In the Amplified, it says it this way. When good things increase, those who consume them increase. So that you have good things and you're getting more and more good things and you're consuming them. And so you increase. I'm not sure I'm following that. And it, it goes on to say, so what advantage is there to their owners except to see them with their eyes? And verse 12 in the KJV says, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. So if you're in labor, I mean, if you're laboring, if you're working, and particularly if you're working hard, it's tiring. Sleep to you then will be very sweet. It will be very satisfying. It, uh, it will renew you. Uh, will restore you, getting rest, getting sleep, whether he eat little or much. Uh, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. So see, the rich won't even be allowed to sleep. They can't sleep because they've got so many things in their mind, you know, business ventures, you know, all these things that they're trying to acquire 
these things that they're pursuing it's occupying all their time all their thoughts and they they're unable to sleep let's see how it phrases it in the amplified the sleep of a working man is sweet whether he eats little or much but the full stomach or greed of the rich who hungers for even more will not let him sleep so reading this uh, <laughs> are you building up an appetite for uh you know gaining riches and wanting more and more material things if the greed grows in you then look like look what you get really get for it you can't even sleep you can never rest your 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 desires are never going to be completely satisfied and you'll never really find peace and now verse uh, 13 in the KJV says, there is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. Riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. So I think it's saying that when rich people just hold on to their riches and they're not using their riches for something that's benevolent, that it ends up hurting them. Uh, let me read that in the Amplified. It says, there is a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun. So that means in the world. This, this kind of thing exists. Uh, riches being kept and hoarded by their owner to his own misery. Yeah. It's just, I'm not a rich man in material things. There was a time in my life where I was really trying to pursue wealth and, and I had some success, and, uh, but um, the, the real riches in life are uh, first, of course, God, Jesus Christ, my savior, that knowing this the love that God has for me and the Bible says we love him because he first loved us, this relationship I have with God, Jesus, my savior, God, this reciprocal love is what is real riches and then my family and friends and these things are the real treasures in life uh, if, if you are seeking your treasures on earth for requiring material gain just uh, building up more and more wealth you're not going to be satisfied it's never going to give you true happiness and this is what solomon who became the richest man in the world this is what he's telling us even acquiring all that wealth, it, he, it was vanity. It was his life. His life was meaningless. Okay, now, um, let me see. That was verse 13. Uh, verse 14 in the KJV says, But those riches perish by evil travail and he begetteth a son and there is nothing in his hand but those riches perish by evil travail the evil uh, travail in other words um, if you have riches if you're working to pursue riches imagine you're one of the richest people um, now you have to have a staff of bodyguards because you're going to always be afraid that you and the people you love could be kidnapped for ransom. So it says, evil travail will come against the rich and he begetteth a son and there is nothing in his hand. So verse 14 in the Amplified says, for when those riches are lost in bad investments and he becomes the father of a son, then there is nothing in his hand for the support of the child. So the Amplified is, is talking about how uh, evil, uh, evil comes. You worked hard to gain riches, and then you lose it because of bad investments. I've had some losses in my investments. And uh, when you suffer these losses, uh, it is, it is a, a worry. You don't want to work to build up um, wealth, and then it's gone. And you don't, you have nothing to leave for your son for your as an inheritance. 
Now, in the, back to the KJV in verse uh, 15, it says, As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. So this is, in a way, expressing that saying that uh, you can't take it with you. You know, you, you came into this world naked, you'll depart this world naked with nothing. So that should tell us something. I mean, while we're alive, you know, you may enjoy uh, some of the things that you acquire. But uh, that's all temporary. You can't take it with you, even though pharaohs thought they could. When you look inside the pyramids and you see how they were buried with all this wealth and, and even slaves were, were buried along with them, they thought that they would uh, have some kind of resurrection and have and have this wealth and these servants there to, to serve them. I don't know if they thought it was going to be in some other world or, or a resurrection as, as we see in the Bible. I'm not that familiar with all the Egyptian religious beliefs, but they thought that they could take it with them. And uh, it says here, we can't. Let me read that in the Amplified. Verse 15 says, as he came naked from his mother's womb, so you're born into this world naked with nothing, so he will return as he came. You're going to return. You're going to You'll die and, and as you came with nothing naked and he will take nothing away, nothing from all his labor that he can carry in his hand. So all the silver, all the gold, uh, all the credit cards, all the fancy cars and all of that, forget it. These are temporary. And as Jesus said, do not seek to build up treasures on earth where moth and rust can destroy it but instead seek to build up treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy. These are eternal treasures. These are the kinds of things that we get through Christian ministry. Every Christian uh, has a ministry. Are you a Christian? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you rely completely on Jesus Christ as the means of salvation? You think you're going to go to heaven because you're a good person and you're religious and and you follow commandments and you follow the golden rule that's not what the bible says is the way to get to heaven the way to heaven jesus is the way you put your faith in jesus you trust him you go to heaven that's what a christian is one who's relying completely on christ well if you're a christian then you have a ministry whether you aware of it or not you do have a ministry uh, yeah, every every christian is a minister a servant it's just that some christians are working at their ministries they're be, they're good ministers others are not even trying or they're failing but we have a ministry and and when we die we get resurrected we go to a judgment not to be judged for heaven or hell heaven is a guaranteed for christians but we get judged based on, upon our ministries. After you put your faith in Jesus, the ministry began right then. And until your last breath, during that period of time, what did you do for Jesus? What did you do for others? Uh, if you did things that God values, then you get rewards. Gold, the Bible calls it gold, silver, precious gems, but these are just symbolic of some kind of rewards that a Christian gets for their ministry, for their service, uh, service to the faith, service to the Savior. And so uh, these are the things that we should be concentrating on building up treasures in heaven rather than on earth because you can't take it with you. And then it says, uh, verse 16 in the KJV, and this also is a sore evil, that in all points as he came, so shall he go. And what profit hath he that hath labored for the wind? In the Amplified, it says, this also is a grievous evil. Exactly as he was born, so he shall die. What, so what advantage has he who labors for the wind? Uh, 
what advantage do you have in laboring? Um, well, maybe you could have more material gain and comfort in this life. And that we are supposed to labor uh, and, and rather than being lazy, uh, we're expected to work so that we have food. The Bible tells us that if you're not willing to work, then you're, you shouldn't expect even to have food to eat. Uh, but to gain more and more wealth, more uh, excess, to have what we need is important. We should be willing to work for it. But to work for more than that, uh, Solomon's saying, it's just vanity because you can't take it with you. Now, if you want to work real hard to build up wealth in heaven and because of your ministry, then that would be worthwhile. That would not be vain, vanity. Okay, let's go back to the KJV and verse 17. All his days also he eateth in darkness, and he hath much sorrow and wrath with his sickness. Well, I don't know if this is talking about a previous verse or then the verse coming up. I'm not sure this verse stands alone, but it, let me read it in the Amplified. It says, all of his life, he also eats in darkness, cheerlessly, without sweetness and light, with great frustration, sickness, and anger. Well, perhaps it's talking about the previous verse, talking about the person that works so hard. See, sometimes people work so hard, they think that they're gaining, and they have a mansion and to live alone. They have all these, uh, you know, material things, and yet they're lonely because all their time was spent gaining wealth rather than to building and developing love and relationships with other people. We talked to earlier about a person who was all alone. And uh, it, it's, it, it really is sad when people are alone. And that's uh, sometimes a result of them being greedy and wanting to spend all their time. And a person can even let their life get out of balance doing a good thing. I was talking about ministry. Uh, there are some famous ministers, uh, pastors, ev evangelists. I mean, I, I don't need to mention anybody's name, but some of these people, their lives have been so dedicated to their ministry that their children don't even know them. They were never home. They were always on the road preaching, always serving everybody, but they neglected their children and their spouse. So uh, even a good thing has to be done in moderation. You've got to have balance. I mean, you've got to have, of course, time for, for Jesus, time for your wife, time for your spouse, time for your children, time for your friends. And if you're dividing your time among all these things, don't expect to excel at one thing. This is something I read once that talked about the champions of the world. If you're a champion at anything, then you, you, you must have become single-minded. You had to focus on that one thing and focus like a laser beam on one thing because the only way you're going to excel above everybody else is putting more effort into it than the others. And when you put all your effort into one thing, guess what? Other things get neglected and they suffer. Friendships, family, relationships, sometimes even health. People pursue money so much, they get so successful, but then they die young because they neglect to taking care of their body. Uh, let's, let me read that in the Amplified. Verse 17, all of his life, he also eats in darkness cheerlessly, without sweetness and light, with great frustration, sickness, and anger. Verse 18 in the KJV says, Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him for his portion. So it's, it's good if you work hard to take some time to enjoy and relax 
uh, uh, enjoy uh, the fruits of your labor. In the Amplified, it states it this way. Behold, here is what I have seen to be good and fitting, to eat and drink and to find enjoyment in all the labor in which he labors under the sun during the few days of his life which God gives him. For this is his allotted reward. This is another example of balance. Work hard, but then you have time to rest and to enjoy it rather than just working to gain more and more. And you don't even have time to enjoy uh, the, the, uh, the gains that you've made. In verse, uh, verse uh, 19 in the, in the KJV says, Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. Well, the gift of God that I love to think about is uh, the salvation. The Bible says in uh, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it says in Ephesians uh, 2, 8 and 9, it says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's telling us that salvation is a gift. Eternal life is a gift. It is the gift of God. Uh, and here, though, this is talking about a man being blessed in his life with riches and saying your riches are a gift from God. And so if you do get blessed in life and you have wealth, uh, you know, it could be a gift, it could be a blessing, it could be a curse, as we, these previous verses have been pointing out. Sometimes pursuing so much wealth, your life doesn't get happy because uh, it got so out of balance. Let me read 19 in the Amplified. It says, also, every man to whom God has given riches and possessions, he has also given the power and ability to enjoy them and to receive this as his allotted portion, and to rejoice in his labor. For this, this is the gift of God to him. Uh, verse 20 in the KJV says, For he shall not much remember the days of his life, because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. Well, I don't know what the last phrase means. The first phrase says, For he shall not much remember the days of his life. Well, as we get old, I guess we forget a lot. Like, what's the earliest memory you have? Is this an interesting question? And I, I've, I've asked a lot of people, think back to the earliest moment of your life that you recall. For me, it was kindergarten. I don't know if you had kindergarten, but kindergarten is, in my day, was where you go to school before the first grade. It's kindergarten. And I remember, I was like five or six years old in kindergarten, I remember doing uh, water painting and playing with clay and doing various things and taking a nap on a towel that we would lay on the floor. All these things are the clear memories. But before that age, I can't tell you anything. How, how far back can you remember? What's your earliest recollection? But the point is, in this verse, it says that... Uh, we're not even going to remember. We have no memories. As we get older, more and more things. I was reflecting the other day. My, my parents have been deceased for some time now. And I was telling my wife, I can't even remember what they look like. And my wife, being so wonderful, she put together a, a wonderful album of photographs of all my family. And it was just quite a, a lot of work she put into it. And now I have this, and I, we don't want to forget uh, our loved ones who are, are departed. And I, now I can look at them and recall, recall their faces, recall all the memories. Uh, each snapshot is a, is a picture of time, that moment in time. And when you look at it, you can remember, oh, I remember that event. I remember when we did that. And these things are great treasures to reflect upon. But in this verse, it says talking about all of us. 
It says, for he shall not much remember the days of his life. As you get older, you're not going to remember much of it. I mean, how much do you remember? Uh, if you divide every moment in your life as, let's say, once a one-second event, how many seconds in a, in a person's life? And as you get older, how many of those seconds, how many of those moments do you remember? A tiny, tiny portion do we actually remember? Now, this is because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. I don't know what that means. Let's see what it says in the Amplified. It says, for he will not often consider the troubled days of his life because God keeps him occupied and focused on the joy of his heart. And the tranquility of God indwells him. So this is this is talking about something entirely different than I than I got out of that verse twenty. I'm talking about not remembering in our lives, and this verse is saying he will not often remember these. Consider the troubled times of your life. You'll for, you can, will forget about all the troubles. What I found though is that the things that we tend to remember are the extremes of our lives. The, the most memorable events are the, the events that are extremely happy or extremely sad. Those are the things to remember. The mundane, everyday things, is we don't tend to remember those. Uh, but it says, uh, because God keeps him occupied and focused on the joy of his heart and the tranquility of God dwells in him. I can speak to that. That certainly applies in my case. I wake up every single day and immediately as soon as I wake up, that's thank you, Jesus. It's another joyful day. God continues to keep this joy uh, in, the, in the front of my mind. And uh, the joys of my heart are there always right there. And uh, Maybe, I don't know if it's because of an effort I'm putting into it to try to concentrate on, on being happy and being joyful. But uh, all I know is that the more I'm thinking about Jesus, when I wake up, the first thing I want to think about Jesus. Throughout the day, I want to think about Jesus. I want to talk about Jesus. I want to talk about the Bible all day. And, and when I'm going to bed at night, the last thing I want in my mind is Jesus. And when we do that, then he does give us this peace, this tranquility, this joy. Well, that's the end of this chapter. So let me let me take a minute now just to close by talking about the gift of salvation. If you're watching this, maybe you stumbled across this and you're not familiar with my YouTube channel and you're not familiar with uh, biblical Christianity. Uh, I want to take a minute and make sure you understand what biblical Christianity is. Because what is taught in churches around the country and by televangelists, and by radio and all over the internet, all over the world today, it's not the kind of Christianity that you find in the Bible. Biblical Christianity is just simply a, a, a belief, trusting Jesus Christ for your salvation a christian is merely a person who is depending completely on jesus for salvation now if i ask you for salvation what are you counting on what are you what is your faith in what are you believing in as a means of going to heaven in other words why should god let you into heaven if god asks you that question well, how would you plead your case? What would you say to God? Most people would say, well, God, I'm, I, I, I've been tried to be good. You know, I, I'm, I'm a good person. You know, I even got religious and go into church and did all the religious things. And I tried to forsake sin and do good deeds. And, is that what you would say? If that's what you would say to God to justify salvation, to say, this is why you should let me into heaven, then I've got bad news for you. The Bible says, those people who are putting their faith in their works and their self-righteousness, Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. That is not the means of salvation. That's not the way to get to heaven. 
biblical Christianity, the Christianity we find in the Bible is simply don't believe in yourself. Don't put any faith in yourself. Make no plea to God that, oh, let me into heaven because I deserve it. No, reject that. Instead, put your faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation. Believe he's your savior. Believe he is the one that's going to take you to heaven. It's like this icon here. Let me see. You see this icon, it's a picture of salvation. Jesus wants to take you to heaven because he loves you. Will you embrace him and trust him and rely on him to get you to heaven? It's that simple. It's that easy. Trust Jesus. Now, who, do you, who is Jesus? The Bible says Jesus is eternal God Almighty. The Bible says he came down from heaven. The Bible says he uh, met, was manifest in the flesh. He was made flesh and lived among us. He became a man named Jesus Christ, the son of God. And he became a man in order to die. He said he came to give his life as a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to set someone free. Jesus came to give his life as a payment to set us free from judgment and condemnation so that you would not be judged for your sins. He was judged and paid the price, death, death on the cross. He paid for our sins. Hey, thank you, Jesus, thank you. And then he was buried. He was in the tomb for three days dead. And then he raised himself to life and he walked bodily for 40 days among 500 witnesses. And they saw him, they talked to him, they touched him. They ate with him. And the bodily resurrection of Jesus is the sign that Jesus promised that would prove his claims were true. He claimed he's God and Savior and life everlasting. He says he is the life. If you put your faith in him, he gives you life everlasting. And the resurrection is the proof his claims were true. So the Bible says that salvation is a free gift. It's a free gift. Jesus is offering it to everyone. He's offering it to you right now. You need to reject everything else as a means of salvation and instead just trust Jesus entirely. When you put your faith completely in him, he gives you life everlasting. You're promised heaven, heaven, and it's a free gift. I hope you'll accept it. I hope you receive it. Put your faith in Jesus now. I hope you uh, like this uh, study tonight on Ecclesiastes. I'll continue with chapter six uh, next time. I do these live uh, broadcasts nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, I'm studying and teaching on a variety of different topics right now. But join me nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time for Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.